I want to start, you know, pull back a uh, big picture and think about, um, I guess really one of the things that interests me so much about your work is your process. So I'm curious about some of your influences to your practice. So mm -hmm. because we've positioned like these two generations within the exhibition, yeah. I know there are influences, I'm sure, from there, but I would love yeah. to hear a little bit about some of those influences. Sure. Um, first, thank you so much for having me. Jennifer McCabe, you trusted me and brought us on, and it's a spectacular museum with an amazing crew to work with. I feel really fortunate. I wish we could have the 900 person <laughs> opening you were planning. So um, I feel really lucky to share it with people in whatever way we get to. Yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, I've been running around helping install for the past two, three days. And because Jennifer's invited me to show my tools, more of my process has been let in. That's actually around the back of that wall. So we can have a photo of it, but it's, it's not in, in view right now. It's a separate little room. And I think we were talking in the car, we were driving, like in a way my process doesn't start with painting at all. It starts mm -hmm. with, with the discipline of like studying ballet as a little kid and studying French and um, coming out of printmaking in high school. And I studied architecture at Cooper Union and I worked as an architect in Europe, in New York, and there's a lot of discipline from so many different areas that, I mean, one of these paintings is named Driven. Like, why am I driven to make these works? And I think that they're, they're a byproduct of a certain discipline in so many other ways before I even began to channel it into painting. And so there's both the process of the discipline of showing up to it, and then there separately is the process of how I physically make the paintings, which is also fairly unorthodox because I don't come to painting through painting. Again, it's the back door through architecture, printmaking, dance, filmmaking, not even filmmaking of my own, but influences upon me growing up with it. Um, that I started graduate school and used tracing paper that came from architecture school. So I was just used to having piles of trace around. And I used the lid of my gesso jar to like sample the material to like lay it down as dumbly as it could, kind of holding drawing away from myself because I was so facile at that, that I would like, in order to learn how to paint, I wanted to take away what I was good at um, so that I could like study material and see what it would tell me when I wasn't, you know, drawing. And drawing also was travel, and I was trying to hold still. Um, I had traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. And I started building this material library, and then the dots all started talking to each other. But each, each dot that I made with my lid of my gesso jar was like gold leaf, or miracle grow, or horse shit, or grass, and concrete. And not shopping at art stores, like shopping at Home Depot, and wanting to kind of eke out of our like world of substances what I would work with. So I still work with all sorts of weird non-art substances, sort of the surviving ones that are more like archival. <laughs> and everything I was using started off with like strawberries and coffee and things that were not archival. So, but the whole idea of sourcing from our lives and a lot of road materials, a lot of materials where the metaphor or what the work is about is just loaded into the material itself. Okay, before we get too far into all the materials, um, just to back it up a little, because you did, you mentioned architecture, these kind of influences, architecture and discipline and coming to your practice. And um, I asked a question when we did the artist talk with your mom about the idea of breaking the rules or thinking, um, you know, we've titled the show Beyond which is in, in one sense speaks to the moment we're in and the hope for getting beyond where we, where we are now. Yeah. But also for me, it's, it's thinking beyond the frame, so to speak. So be, not being afraid to break the rules or go outside the lines or however you want to say it. 
Um, but I thought it was really interesting because your mom said, oh no, I don't, I, I don't do that. And don't, I thought, don't break the rules. Don't break the rules. Yeah. And, and, and I thought you must, I mean, do you think you learned some of that? Um, well, she's also confidence to, to break the rules. Do you think you learned some of that from your mom or from your upbringing? I think there's a lot of rules we do adhere to. I mean, she adheres to Armin Hoffman. Mm -hmm. I'm, and I kind of have that innately in me through her. There's like a ton of rules I'm listening to, but they're not really necessarily the exterior rules that um, a given situation is handing us. Like we're kind of like educationally coming with a set of, I don't know, could be called rules, could be called baggage, but <laughs> <laughs> ways of making decisions. Mm -hmm. And also she's a contrarian. If you tell her she can't break the rules, she'll break the rules by telling you she does or she doesn't. Which is a rule she'll breaker. You, yeah. So she's a gonna, rule breaker. She has authority issues. She's going <laughs> to flip it on you no matter what you okay. say. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> um, well, because I think of your, your paintings are on mylar, which is not what you would customarily find paintings on. And um, Barbara has paintings in the next gallery. She doesn't usually do paintings, but because she's done them on canvas and use, she's done these artworks on canvas with paint, she likes to call them paintings. She doesn't really think of them as paintings. So there's this. Yeah, I mean, those are a funny series of paintings because in a way it's like we were joking that they could be called like, ce n'est pas une pipe, this is not a ping pong table mm -hmm. because there are like an idea of a painting. So they're like kind of a parody of a painting, right? because they're, I mean, these romantic space that's made out of this hard edge ping pong table. And, you know, she did learn, as she would call it, drip and drool um, at SFAI back in when it was Clifford Still and Demon Corn and Bischoff. Those were teachers of hers. And they said, never use green. So, of course, she made a whole career out of like virility green. Mm -hmm. And those paintings, she wants, I think, Von Bartha, who's now representing her, wants them. And she's like, just stepped into like owning it. We're like, let's title them finally. Like, this is not a ping pong table. This is not a painting. Right. Where they're sort of conceptually a game and a joke. And that's why the whole idea of playing in front of them, which is something we set up to happen in, I think it was 89? 1990. Was it 90? At, at SF MoMA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Paolo Polidri shut us down because it was not yet cool to have interactive museum exhibitions. And my high school friends and I, we were the plants and we picked up the paddles and he repoed them right away. So this was, uh, this was an exhibition at SF MoMA uh, for visionary architects at the time. And your mother trained as an architect also, and she was invited to the exhibition. So she showed these beautiful drawings from Green Architecture Series along with these giant ping pong, or paintings the size of ping pong tables, essentially, with the ping pong tables to play, but they weren't allowed to play. Um, and when I saw her exhibition in Palm Springs Museum, I thought this is such a smart combination of works that are, that are and, and the scale of them is so interesting. Um, and interactive was great about eight or nine months ago. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know, we've come full so circle. so fun anymore. <laughs> whatever. We try to space them out, we clean the balls. Um, <laughs> Okay, but I want to talk a little bit about the works that we have in the gallery space because we've chosen or I've chosen to show two different arms of your practice. So I would say you're more known for these large scale, they're eight by eight foot generally, um, paintings that are very gestural, abstract. They're layered with um, different materials, textures, um, they play with negative space. I'm looking at it behind you and they're, um, right, they're amazing. And then you have an older series and maybe we can drop in an image of um, maybe this one. Uh, the Driven, the yeah. new narrative, what you call the new narrative series. Mm -hmm. um, and in these works, you're writing in them, you're putting words, you're putting very realistic, um, images of people, places, um, really specific ideas, and uh, and very much being critical of being critical of our society, of our of your place within the art world, of questioning things, of just being really open about about all of these ideas that kind of flood your mind, right, or challenge you in some way. 
And when I saw those, I thought there were so many similarities in a way to the larger, more abstract, more gestural works. Um, because I know there is, there are these layers of content even within those. So let's start though with the new narrative series and talk a little bit about the one that we have an image up of. Okay. Um, that one's driven. And uh, oh, this one's actually love of driving. That one's driven. So that was about the internal drive. And this one's about our love of driving. And all the complexity and, you know, we know we're driving ourselves into the ground. And yet we adore it. And it's our whole sense of ourselves and freedom. And the painting brings together all the, like, has the 405 and the 10 doubled and has the, the investor meeting and the big chandelier at the Fairmont and all of the, and the oil pool and the car keys and the whoosh of the whole thing are there to break up and violate the sort of sublime abstract painting space that I had been playing in for, you know, and known for, for a long time, a while at least at that point. And I wanted to literally like drive through the painting with everything you're not allowed to talk about in painting. Mm -hmm. Some of them are very personal. That one is about, is, that one's much more about America and our whole society. Um, and I love driving. It's not a pointing the fingers at somebody else. I'm very much embrace the oxymoron of being a part of the mess. Um, but I wanted to create like a big sublime abstract painting that was also gonna rip itself apart from the inside and operated as a painting at the same time as like have it deconstruct itself with its own ideas of everything you can't say in a painting. Mm -hmm. So this one's about the art world, definitely something you're not supposed to talk about in a painting. The other one is like super personal and it, it deals with all sorts of forces in life, like escape, love, marriage, friendship, being shunned. I mean like everything you're not allowed to talk about. That was the first one I did and it just, once I did that, there was kind of no backing off of that. I was like, I kind of have, there's a bunch more paintings after this one that I kind of have to go for. Mm -hmm. um, but the original impetus was to rip apart the sublime abstract space. Yeah. That you've embraced. That I've been, you know, that I revere mm -hmm. and that I make. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I I'm love painting, but I also like definitely want to take a pot shot at and rip straight through it. And maybe, yeah, that has to do with my, authority issues that I'm born into <laughs> <laughs> that you come to fairly yeah. honestly <laughs> all right so let's juxtapose that with one of these which one sure. would you um well behind me there's there's um breaking up the concrete cloud there's matchstick and then there's um rattling the pipes and those three all came over, over this summer so this is a very specific summer in world history. Mm -hmm. And breaking up the concrete cloud, like I had originally wanted to like, I had this idea as I was moving to LA, knew that I wanted to like dump asphalt in the corner of a huge sheet of mylar and I'm still technically getting there and I'm working with a new fabricator who's wonderful and like knowing that I'm making a really heavy one area of a painting as a challenge to him, like how are we gonna support it? I want vast emptiness and impossible density in the same sheet of mylar, something I can't pull out, pull off without a substructure. Mm -hmm. We hung them today, you can see it's sketchy. And, and yet we had just been, it was the first night so I could begin to go to my studio after the quarantine had ended. And the pandemic pretty quickly led into the race riots, mm -hmm. which pretty quickly also had sort of the counter surge of civil liberties and the sort of pendulum of America's swinging mess of contradictions. And that's not something I, I mean, that's what paintings are made out of. They're like, there's, I feel like paintings have different roles simultaneously and different paintings can have different roles and the same painter can take on different roles. Whether it's going to be the truth about what's happening or an elixir for what's happening, I feel like in the course of painting for this show and while I was making that movie with Christian Bruno, I actually went through a gear shift. Like I was making really black paintings that were 
I use these glass tools and I drive the paint on the mylar and then I turn it and these sort of interlocking forms, which, you know, it's like every street you go down, you can't go down that, you can't get to here. Like that's what every train of thought for a little while, everything was happening so quickly for all of us. Yeah. And we're still in a no man's land. It's not like we've arrived somewhere. We're just less bombarded a little bit than we or maybe a little desensitized after the summer too. Mm -hmm. Um, but I wanted to catch that raw moment in world history. It's not just even American history. And yeah, it has the hint of the swastika. And yeah, it's like in... Maybe we can show one of... Um, I think that if you show um, Matchstick, that was the first you. in that series. And um, still just like making a short movie out of like having film making it. And... Um, wanting to continually disrupt the painting as I was making the painting, make the painting out of a series of roadblocks and disruptions until it would just burst outside of itself. The breaking up the concrete cloud was from an impossible area of density and then exploding and ripping it apart. Mm -hmm. um, and rattling the pipes like is to take the whole same idea and jitter it while it's being made because the whole thing just started to vibrate as, as a time. Can we and show the other, the next one of yeah, that? Yeah, this one mm -hmm. is um, rattling, the pipes. rattling the pipes. And there's a book that I made while I was making these, because at home I would try to kind of suss out where I was going to take the next moves, and I would just use an ink, big fat brush on the dining room table, like, and every time one would dry, I'd flip the page, and I'd just take this butcher block that was a square that represented the eight by eight, and the seam is down the middle of the square like the eight by eights have and i would make what's also outside the frame because i feel like my paintings are always like just a little glimpse of what's actually much bigger and goes outside the frame mm -hmm. so in the sketchbook i like got to go further it's a way of making a small thing even bigger than i can make the eight by eight and just repeatedly getting from where how i'd get from the curved form into these um road blocking forms and then that kind of exploded through the course of the book and let it get as unruly as it's going to get and play that out at that scale. I don't usually do sketches, but I kind of needed to to because I couldn't leave the house because we're under quarantine and there's sky writing saying, you know, don't leave the house. <laughs> And then take those ideas to the studio and play them out. And I kind of like ran out of juice after these three. Like I made some others, but I didn't think they were good. Which is so, it's, it's interesting how things have uh, played out just for this exhibition because we were meant to open in May, I believe. And we wouldn't be showing half of these works yeah. because they were made in the interim of yeah. when we moved the exhibition, which we had to do. We we're continuing to do it, to move <laughs> yeah. things. Um, along and to make plans and to adapt as we go, yeah. all of that. Will you talk a little bit about the scale of the works? Because um, they're large, like I said, eight by eight feet, and you are, I would describe you as petite. Yeah. Um, so to physically get across the space I is, crawl. is something, <laughs> right? But you told a, a kind of um, an interesting story as to how you felt like you got to the scale of the work. Um, and the idea that you work on the floor, so. Yeah, I mean, I got to this scale during the course of graduate school, and there was a guy who washed buses. And I just thought he was like the greatest painter I'd ever seen. And it was CCA, and we, they had just built that giant building, and I was collaborating with a guy who was kind of off the hook, and we sort of set up out in public, and pushed out, pushed the like a shopping cart out there, and pretended I would leave at some point if needed, but nobody asked me to leave and I didn't leave. And I would work from like three in the morning till, I mean, three in the afternoon till three in the morning, put on headphones and pretend that I was listening to something when I wasn't, just to like try to blank out. And I was near the vending machines. So, and there was this giant um, glass wall. And on the other side of that was the guy who washed the buses. And he had this maybe two and a half, three foot wide soapy mop on a stick with a swivel and he would wash the buses with like this grand sweeping gesture with this authority 
and urgency. And I remember sitting there like with my little oval tools like on the floor, building these paintings out of momentum. And I hadn't yet gotten to that sweeping shape. And I was like, he's really good. And I would just watch him. And wanting to bring that sort of authority and urgency and unselfconscious um, dealing with scale, not in a like, oh, it's really big art kind of way, but because I work flat on the ground, like it's not intimidating to scrub an eight foot kitchen floor. Mm -hmm. So why would it be hard to get a tool? And I, then I ended up developing these glass tools, which I hadn't done yet. I continually make tools and I have industrial designers make tools for me that will help me make the mark I'm thinking I want to make um, that would let me extend your hand. It's yeah, and, it's extension mm -hmm. of my body. Mm -hmm. And I make big architectural tools that are like giant adjustable French curves and things that mm -hmm. will let me extend my thoughts into a scale that's like a dance scale. Cause I do come out of ballet. Right. Um, and I do like when I climb out and I'm like reaching, like I realize like, it's kind of like a surfing move. You know, you're kind of like laying mm -hmm. on your belly and you're reaching out. And I think it's all, I run up and down ladders a lot. <laughs> and I look down and I can correct for the parallax. Like my mom, would, my mom and I have crit each other all our life, well, mm -hmm. all my life. And she can't see what something is until it's up. And she can't see what something is when it's half done. But I'm pretty good at being able to run up the ladder and look down. I have a pretty good idea what that thing's going to be once it goes up. Um, but she looks, works little. And I work big, so it's different. Right. In the, um, except for the super graphics, and we have right. some of those in the gallery, but you both have such a good sense of space and the spatial relationships that happen with a body in the space and with the existing and it both comes architecture. Out of dance. Comes I mean, out of even dance. you put mm -hmm. me up in this beautiful place to stay, and there's this magnificent swimming pool. And I, a, a nod to my mother, who's mostly paralyzed at this point, mm -hmm. and she loves to swim. I've been using it like we we would jokingly, we'd break into like Versailles, like before it opened, um, so that we wouldn't have like, you know, that German tourist in the blue sky. And we would, we would walk on center and then we would part at the stairs and come back together. And like, I swim the laps and then I go around and I dive in and I go up and use the architecture as a big ballet space, a big mm -hmm. dance space. Mm -hmm. And I think that her way of stringing through space in super graphics, like she and I can talk back and forth kind of through osmosis about how to solve a space or um, in a way I've put myself into an arena of painting that's intelligible because now she has a lot of success, but for a while people are like, they don't, you know, she's not animal, vegetable, or mineral, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay. which is a lot of her brilliance, but a lot of what's been missed. Do you feel like you've had that informal collaboration over the years? Definitely. And, you know, I'd stop by her house and give her a crit on the way to the studio. And she'd come to my studio and give me a crit. Mm -hmm. She's been doing that for, you know, off and on for 20, 40 years. Yeah. Which is, yeah, I love the, I love, I love doing things that either haven't been done before, um, showing works that you haven't shown before. Like when yeah. you said to me, well, I've never shown these. Nobody's ever wanted to show them. I was like, well, maybe you don't know who you're talking to, but we're definitely showing those now. <laughs> now that's the challenge. <laughs> I'm so happy you're showing these works because I've held them back. Like I haven't let them sell. Like they need to be shown actually in an institutional context. I think what you wrote about them is great. And it's like, they don't make sense until somebody makes sense of them. And I don't want to let them out into the world as objects that are kind of like pretty and mute that was not the point well the relationship between these works and the more abstract ones again because I don't know if we really dug into this as much as I wanted to is that there's all this content piled in into the narrative works yeah and there's all this content piled into the abstract works, Definitely. which is why I think I'm drawn to your process so much is because there is like you're talking about so much testing we're showing um, behind the wall of the gallery, um, a snapshot of Nellie's studio space because she has these test strips with handwritten notes about every material under the sun, really, <laughs> um, probably, and, you know, <laughs> hundreds of tools and hundreds of paint bottles. And it's just such a fascinating, um, lovely space that 
speaks to the thought that you're putting behind, behind every mark of these abstract paintings, behind the materials that go into them, using the road materials. Yeah. And what are, what are some of the other materials that you're um, I incorporating? I use soda ash, which makes things corroded. I use crystallina, which gives me like a light interference thing. Um, I use um, this pounce of um, a really dry red dirt from Red Rock, and I love that it comes from right outside of Vegas. Like there's just like an irony to that that I that I like the Americana of it. Um, silicone carbide coarse, silicone carbide fine. One is what's in grip tape. One is what's in the sparkly W sidewalks. I love that like those are concrete materials and that like the ex taqueria guy who I made friends with, his dad was a concrete guy and he drove me around and found the materials. Like there's like a relationship in life experiences behind piling, you know, gathering all these materials. Mm -hmm. um, glass beads, which is a road material. It's what makes the double yellow line reflective. Um, and that sort of sublime, expansive release that we associate with road trips and cars and our love of driving. Like I want that materially in the work. Like I only wanted to shop at Home Depot. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna use art materials. I wanna use stuff that is loaded with who we are. Right, yeah, right. Let's um, show an image of vitamin D. Yeah, I keep looking at it. <laughs> yeah, you're looking at that. I'm looking at these, so <laughs> let's, talk about, let's talk about vitamin D because you describe it as the elixir that comes at the end of all of these kind of tortured moments that we've been living through, um, through protests and yeah, I pandemic mean, and all of that. I did these with the background noise of and explosions in Inglewood of uh, fireworks for Breonna Taylor. Like it was very mm -hmm. intense and very of a moment. And I could only do them so long. I think it was right in the middle of getting the movie with Christian Bruno. And I was just like, I think I'm done. I don't think I can make another black painting right now. Like I'm wrung out and I've been as raw and honest with it as I can be to channel what's been going on within where we are. And um, I don't wanna see it anymore. I don't wanna make it anymore. I don't think anybody else needs to see it anymore. That's where painting has a couple different roles. And I think you and I have talked about that a lot. Like whether it always has to be political mm -hmm. or whether it's also essential to provide amnesty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and like I say, this, this upcoming Elixir series that I still have a few more in my head that I'm thinking about where, I mean, this was vitamin D. Like I wanted to make the surface of the sun like to hit you with all of the immunity mm -hmm. and um, sort of restorative um, vitamins that you could hit somebody with visually. That is what you know. people are in their little kitchen trying to do to themselves to save themselves from everything that's going on around them. Mm -hmm. I want the painting to operate that way. We were joking earlier. We were all in front of it. There was some like streaming on it. We're like, oh, I can feel it. <laughs> it has like, an yeah, energy. That's, I, painting, I, what I love about painting is it's not a time-based medium. It has text all right away. It either sucks or it's wonderful right away. Mm -hmm. And I want a painting that like, like vitamin D is meant to unpack. And finally, that it's hung here in a hung lit well it's the first time it's operated well the emptier cleaner paintings don't operate as well when they're hung badly and lit badly and they start to operate when they can give you um like this wash of color and light and um the emptiness that needs to operate in them too mm -hmm. yeah so yeah those are the idea of i mean it's not it's not only just an idea but it's like an urgency of creating the medicine after you've gone deep enough into the problem. I don't think it's a gift to continually give people um, Which we're didn't. not out of the, pro the problem. No, we're not, right? I'm not but saying we're out of it. <laughs> that's, that's far from what I'm going to say, but I do think that at a certain point, like at, when is it culture's job to call out the truths and when is it the job to provide um, respite, mm -hmm. intelligent respite that acknowledges right. what's going on but isn't 
mired in it, isn't drowning. It, it's like a, mm -hmm. you know, a raft. Like, so throw somebody a life preserver. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of, I intentionally ride back and forth on that. I need it, and I think other people need it. And I don't think it's really that interesting to have a didactic, at least for me, mm -hmm. a career that would be like purely didactic and political and socio-political, or that's purely uh, eye, ki eye candy. And every time I deliver eye candy, there's always a twist. Like the material's right. always got some sort of like, oh, it's not so simple twist. Which is why I love your work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Is that twist, whether you want to acknowledge it as a viewer or you don't, it's really, it's up to you to unpack it a little bit or to just The titles are enjoy sometimes it. in code, and even mm -hmm. those that are narrative are pretty explicit, they're still in code. I mean, I write, which is less in code, but I do that less publicly yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I want to be able to open it up for questions, if there are questions, if there's a question. If anyone else has questions, you can be thinking about it. Um, we're going to do a little moderation through the Q and A. I come out of architecture school. Repeat like, the question. Will okay, you? the question had to do with Duralar or uh, Mylar. Or, there's a million different words for it, but I. Um, it's a drafting vellum, but it's a heavier mill, so you can't just rip it. But I did start on vellum, and I did start on tracing paper, and I gradually found bigger. It was actually really generously Ingrid Kalam, who was showing at the Matrix through Larry Render, who Larry Render gave me her phone number. I called her, and I said, what's that stuff? And she gave me the distributor. And I've since moved on because the, the mylar has been re-engineered and there's like powder coating and all these. But it's a drafting vellum. I come out of architecture. So it's like the heaviest mill catamat that's made for aerospace design. It used to be able to buy it really cheaply and it was the runoff pieces that were used for the documents between the Library of Congress. Um, so it was that inert. The pH balance is so stable that that's what they use to save. Um, and also it was used for aerospace design printing. And that's subsequently like, you know, digitized and no longer necessary. So it's not as cheap or as readily available as it was when I started. And I've tried leaving it. and I've tried Canvas and I spent three years on Canvas and I still do commissions if they come. But I'm really excited about working with my fabricator to take the mylar pieces that feel so innate to me it feels like a home base material that i really know how to work with and then he mounts them and solidifies them and i'm still working with him how to handle the decals and how to make them join and how to work it all out we're a year into the journey love each other not quite done figuring it out <laughs> but we're starting to make them work and i feel like it's the fruition of where the mylar has been wanting to go all along um, it's an architecture material I feel comfortable in. I am grateful for the momentum because it is such a rough time to know what you're doing with yourself. And I had just moved to LA. I have a little girl. There was a lot of kismet that led to this show. I mean, I have a dear friend who's with my daughter right now who mopped my floor and said a prayer and then commissions started rolling in. Oh my God, I just couldn't even make them fast enough, but it was money, so I did it. And then the pandemic hit, but right before that, mm -hmm. you invited me to the show. We had the whole studio visit. We were planning the giant 900 person opening and despite, and then the, the date kept getting pushed back, which allowed me the push that I needed to make these works about the pandemic and about 2020, which is a really loaded mm -hmm. and unforgettably complicated time in world history. And I don't know that I would have made these paintings because they were not easy to make, but 
I do really well with deadlines. Like it's the architect kid in me, the like ballet dancer, the discipline. Like you give me a deadline, I'll work really hard right all the way up to it. And um, it's depressing for me not to have deadlines. So I thank you. Well, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's really our greatest joy as an institution to be able to commission new works, to provide this kind of space for artists to even think about making a work that is of the moment yeah. um, because that isn't exactly what we were intending in the beginning but all along we've had to definitely be flexible <laughs> um, if you're playing the drinking game we've had to pivot um, <laughs> I want to know this drinking so game many times <laughs> maybe it's just an institutional thing everyone is always saying well we we had to pivot when the <laughs> pandemic hit and then we had to pivot um, but we really did. We changed, we changed dates. We changed directions. We also, we talked a lot early on about what it would be like to open an exhibition without the people in the gallery and how would we handle that? Because no matter everyone's best intentions to open, you know, we had, we had chosen a date for the museum as early as July and here we are in September and we're not open yet. Um, and so I appreciated having this dialogue with you, Nellie, about, well, what can we do to make this an interesting experience if people and when people can't come to the gallery space? Yeah. Because we know even when we reopen, not everyone will be able to come well, I or want to come. So we built up virtual, a virtual side of things in yeah. which you, you've been referring to the film by Christian Bruno. There will be, um, on our website, we will have, he's already completed a film of uh, Barbara, her life and work, and he's finishing one up on Nelly that was made during this moment. So that will be available. And then again, this artist talk, the three-way yeah. artist talk. Yeah. And I think that it's a time when film becomes increasingly more important and how to figure it out as a medium um, becomes more urgent because if we can't be together, people want a clickable triangle. They're laying on their side in bed, you know, and, and um, when everybody's been sent to their room, how do we all reconnect? Thank you, Nellie, so much for being here um, tonight. I'm glad we had an opportunity to pull together this sort of artist talk. Um, and really thank you everyone who was able to join us tonight. 